a very warm welcome to you thank you very much for joining us to this session today it's a wonderful blessing and a privilege to know that we can spend at uh, this time as we study god's word together with you i want us to share in a prayer that as we open the word of god he may give us understanding we may have clarity of thought and we may have the strength to discharge all that the lord places in our heart to do let us pray eternal god and father in heaven hallowed be thy name Thank you for your magnificence that you have shown us every day of our lives. We gather together today to study your word, Lord. Open the understanding of our heart that we may see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and walk with you more closely. Thank you for the viewer who is joining us, Lord. I pray that you may strike a chord in their hearts, that your spirit will move through and through to teach us of that which we need to know. Thank you for your ever-abiding presence, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are having our lesson session today and we're going to study something very important and key from the book of Genesis. Lessons that we can draw from patriarchs of scripture that are relatable to our day-to-day -day experience. I am Becky Arunga Omondi and I invite you to join as we study together hoping that the word of God will be beautiful and sweet to you. When you're looking at the book of Genesis, it gives us an account as to the origin of the Jewish people, an account as to the origin of mankind. It gives us an excerpt on God's judgment, but at the same time, we get to learn about God's grace. There is something beautiful about the book of Genesis. It introduces us to the tribe of Israel, the tribe that is recognized in the name of Abraham, in the name of Jacob, in the name of Isaac, and today we just want to glean certain beautiful truths from the experience of Jacob and Joseph in Egypt. These are people we have learned from our childhood. What is it about them that is so important, that is so beautiful? And if perchance you're watching this from Africa, isn't it beautiful that Egypt is in Africa and we get to learn about it? So Genesis chapter 47 verse 27 says, So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. One may wonder why am I saying so Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt? Isn't Israel a nation? How be it that it dwells in Egypt? No. Israel was the name that Jacob was given after he had fought with God and prevailed. And so God removed his name Jacob which means deceiver or supplanter to the name Israel, which means great nation. When you look at the name Israel, we are told that they dwelt in Egypt, in the country of Goshen. This text is memory lane to the moment when famine struck Canaan and Joseph invited Jacob and his family to come and dwell with him in Egypt, now that he was the second in command. When they came to Egypt, Jacob and his family, they were 70 in number. But the Bible tells us that they had possessions there. They grew and they multiplied. This reminds us of God's promise to Abraham, where God told Abraham, be fruitful, multiply, and fill. when God told Abraham that he will make him great. When God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Now, as we look into this particular story of Jacob, or Israel in Egypt, when he arrives in Egypt, Jacob meets Pharaoh and Jacob blesses Pharaoh. One would wonder why would Jacob, a mere mortal, bless Pharaoh who was like the king of kings at that particular time. And when we look at Joseph's family or rather Jacob's family dwelling in Egypt, were they dwelling in Egypt as um, immigrants? Were they dwelling in Egypt for a temporary season? And what were they really doing in this entire period that they were in Egypt? So in this particular study, certain significant things come out. One, we're going to learn how important it is to deal with forgiveness in a family setup. What you're going to do is to find out how to deal with the guilt, how to deal with forgiveness, and how the Lord teaches you and I to forgive. Because more often than not, we'll be hurt by family, by friends, by colleagues, by people we have placed close to our heart. The second thing that I wanted to point out is 
what role does god play in our choices because often than more often than not we hear people say that ah i'm not going to do anything because god has decided what the future holds but i want us to learn in our study today that though the lord knows the future he does not influence our choices so on to our first item of study we're asking ourselves when joseph brought his brothers to egypt his brothers were afraid that should their father die joseph might avenge might revenge and so the first question really that we need to ask ourselves is that what do we do with the guilt we harbor over a wrong done what do i mean joseph grew up with his brothers they were together but he was the most loved of his father when his father bought him the coat of many colors that was like the last true and his brothers got incensed when joseph brought them food they plotted against him and sold him to the ishmaelite traders this is when joseph was barely a teenager many years later when their dad jacob is on his deathbed these brothers are still harboring the same feeling of guilt that they had as it were when they sold joseph to slavery and we're asking ourselves how do we deal with the guilt what is it that you're guilty of could it be that there's something you did as a child could it be that there's something you did in your first place of employment could you be if you're in a family life there's something you've done against your spouse and every day passes and the guilt over your wrongdoing consumes and eats you up and you wonder how will i deal with this like joseph's brothers this guilt consumed them over and over again and it propelled every action they undertook care to note that when joseph requested them to bring benjamin memories of how they sold joseph years back came flooding and their first reaction was if this benjamin dies then our father will die too they were ready to protect they were willing to protect benjamin because they were not willing to afford another second chance or second instance of guilt and i don't know your experience how it has been but the interesting bit is that where as joseph's brothers were guilty they were being eaten by their guilt all this long joseph had forgiven them secondly where as joseph's brothers were harboring this guilt this guilt that kept them lying over and over again to their to their father ultimately their father came to know that joseph had not died that their lie had been exposed in as much as joseph's brothers kept harboring this guilt in their heart this guilt never saved them from the calamities that life afforded they still got hungry there was still famine in the land and they still had to go to egypt and lastly well in as much as they were harboring this guilt in their heart they finally had to confront it when they came face to face with joseph so then what ought we do one thing the bible admonishes us is that we should in as much as is within our power we should always tell the truth and secondly when you have faulted or done something wrong confess your faults one to another now the book of first john chapter 1 verse 9 says If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us from all our sin and cleanse us from all forms of unrighteousness. So God is just enough to forgive us. So if by chance there is a guilt that you harbor, first things first, confess that fault to whom it is due. If that is too difficult, then pray to God to give you strength as you confess to God. that the lord will give you strength to overcome that guilt because guilt has a way of eating us up and thirdly that sin that you're hiding it will come out some day it regardless of how long it took jacob finally learned that his sons were lying to him about the true whereabouts of joseph and having learned about guilt the other the flip side is this 
how did joseph react to his brothers even though they had dealt wrongly with him when joseph heard that they were hungry he was willing to have them come over not to teach them a lesson that see i have overcome i have become better than you but he could not stand his siblings dying of hunger he could not stand his family his entire generation being wiped away on account of hunger or famine and so to you who has hurt you is it your friend is it your parent is it your sibling is it a close friend is it someone you shared things with someone you considered loyal and you have harbored it in their heart and you can't wait to show them how much you've made it in life let us learn from joseph that people who have hurt us are already hurting from the guilt of hurting us the best we can do is to forgive them the best you can do is to let go the best you can do is to remove them release them from the prison of your heart so that they are not hurting you again and again because they also are already hurting so that's very key as we learn in the life of joseph secondly something else that we need to point out as we studying the life of jacob in egypt one thing that really stands out is that in the book of genesis chapter 46 jacob leaves the land of promise to go to egypt he leaves the land of promise that god himself had bid him go to the land of canaan and therein i will make you a great nation but it reached a point where the land of canaan that which god himself had already promised proved to be inhabitable on account of the famine and so he left his place he left canaan to where to egypt now we can make a parallel between jacob in egypt and abraham in egypt when abraham left canaan to go to egypt because there was famine in canaan he did not go under god's instruction and so when he got to egypt he had to lie that sarah was his sister he had to lie israel isaac the same when he went to egypt he had to lie that rebecca was his sister but the consequences of their lie befell the family of pharaoh now when you contrast that with the experience of jacob in egypt jacob did not go to egypt on his volition he did not go alone he was invited not only by joseph but confirmed by god let's read genesis 46 verse 3 it says so he said let's start from verse 2 then god spoke to israel in the visions of the night and said jacob jacob and he said here i am so he said i am god the god of your father do not fear to go down to egypt for i will make of you a great nation there joseph had invited jacob to egypt but it is god who had instructed jacob to stay in canaan so it required god to instruct jacob to go to where to egypt what beautiful lesson do we learn from here is that you and i need to be connected to heaven to be able to listen to the voice of god telling us what to do god had given canaan as the land of promise but god still again was removing them from the land of promise to the land of egypt why because had they insisted that canaan was god's purpose for them at that time they would have died of hunger and there would have been no hope for the human race but because they kept listening to god they knew that the lord who brought them to canaan is the same one who was instructing them out of canaan beloved christian beloved viewer wherever you are are you still in tune with the voice of god or are you still relying on the faith you had when you first believed are you still relying on your experience 10 years ago five years ago one week ago what is the lord saying today what is the vision that the lord is bringing today remember joseph was a man accomplished a man who feared the lord he told his father yes come to egypt but jacob did not go to egypt because joseph said he should go jacob went to egypt because the lord confirmed in a night vision that he ought to go to egypt 
how many of us have surrendered the life we live to the voice of motivational speakers, of preachers, of pastors, of priests, and of many spiritual fathers? In the life of Jacob, as he made his journey to Egypt, we come to appreciate it is not enough to just listen to the man of God. Has the Lord confirmed it? When Jacob went to see his son Joseph in Egypt, when Jacob decided to dwell in Egypt with his family, it was not because Joseph was the second in command in Egypt. It is because God commanded that Jacob ought to go to Egypt for he had a plan for him there. What does the scripture says? Verse 4, I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely, surely bring you up again and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. The Lord tells Jacob, I am the one who gave you this land as a promised land. But for this period, it is not habitable on account of the famine. God had capacity to make um, Canaan viable once again for their good. But God did not want them to stay in Canaan. What did he do? He was to take them to Egypt. But he would bring them back again to where? To Canaan. And so the lesson that we pick from this particular point is that the Lord is present to confirm to us his will every passing moment. And we need to be in tune that we may lead a life of obedience. That we may lead a life that gives glory and honor to his name. So when Jacob settled in Egypt, again, something comes, comes out clearly. That Pharaoh asked Joseph, what is it that you want your family to do in Egypt? Joseph had the capacity to have his siblings occupy the highest positions in Egypt. But knowing too well the ability of the Egyptian religion to compromise the Hebrew religion, Joseph simply said that our family, we are what? We are farmers. And so they were given that place in Goshen. Genesis 47 verse 3 says, Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. Then, <clears throat> verse 5 says, Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen, pintent men among them. Then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. There was the capacity of Pharaoh or Joseph to have them be converted to people who served the Pharaoh. But Joseph said that our people are herdsmen, and Pharaoh in turn made them the chief's herdsmen. Now, what is your occupation? We all know we all don't have to be the best pastor, the best deacon, the best preacher. But that occupation that you have, the Lord uses it to elevate you to the chief position that He can. These brothers of Joseph, inexperienced men dwelling in the superpower of that time, Egypt, got the favor of Pharaoh and became the chief herdsman over the livestock of Pharaoh. Friend, you need not change your passions. You need not change who you are. You need not change your profession to serve the Lord. The Lord is capable of exalting you in where you are. That you, if you are serving him as a janitor, then it would go on record that he herein lived the janitor of all time, the best the world has ever seen. If perchance you're serving the Lord in the capacity of a teacher, teaching students, young pupils, kindergarten, in that capacity, the Lord is able to make you the chief teacher. If you are the driver of a motor vehicle, then the Lord is able to make you the chief driver. If perchance you are a farmer, then he is able to make you the chief farmer. Only be faithful in that little one that the Lord has appointed you to. We have learned that when Jacob settled in Egypt, he did not settle into the Egyptian occupation. His family did not settle and conform into what Egyptians did. They simply perfected that which they have always done, which is 
herding and they were made the chief herdsmen and jacob knowing that his time was waning and he was about to die went about giving blessing and something incredible that we learn now we are in genesis chapter 48 as jacob is blessing his sons he interestingly also blesses the sons of joseph let's get in 48 verse 5 it says and now your two sons ephraim and manasseh who were born to you in the land of egypt before i came to you in egypt are mine as reuben and simeon they shall be mine now jacob had spent a great deal of his life without joseph his son for he had been under the impression that joseph had died now when out of god's grace and mercy he saw ephraim and manasseh and like his other grandsons, he adopted them as his sons. He reconnected with them as the young children they were, in a manner likely to suggest that he was reconnecting with the young Joseph that had actually been sold to exile. And he adopted them and said, Ephraim and Manasseh are mine. So Jacob, in essence, through Ephraim and Manasseh, was confirming and affirming that God is faithful, that essentially, the Lord who had enabled Joseph to come to where he was as the second in command in Egypt was the Lord who has made it possible for Jacob to see his grandchildren. And so he did not look at Joseph merely, but he saw beyond Joseph and experienced the grandchildren that the Lord has blessed him with. So when we look at this particular blessing, we realize that even as Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh and took them as his own, it was essentially the blessing of Joseph. And through that, we are able to see the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. We see that the Lord himself was able to bless abundantly the children of Israel. The Lord who had blessed Jacob by changing his name to Israel is the same God who blessed Joseph by blessing his sons through Jacob. And in that particular experience, we get to know that it does not matter. The blessings of the Lord do not know any haste or delay. They come at the time that the Lord himself appoints. So after blessing the sons of Joseph, Jacob blessed his sons. And it's interesting to note that in blessing his other sons, he mentions things about them regarding what they had each done, regarding the blessing or the future that they're going to have. When we come to the blessing of Judah, Genesis chapter 49 verse 8, we are told, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So you see that through the blessing of Judah, the Lord intended that the royal, the Messiah, be born from the tribe of Judah. Not that the first son, the second son, and the third son had not, um, ha, were not justified in having this particular promise. But the Lord, out of his own design and plan, chose Judah to be the one who would be the progenitor of the messianic kingdom. And from the tribe of Judah, we find David, young King David, who becomes a great, great, great grandfather of the Messiah. We also get to note that before Je David was king, Benjamin, Benjamin's tribe produced the first king of Israel, which is King Saul. And so King Saul had an opportunity, but on account of his evil and wicked deeds, he did not find favor before the Lord. Just, this is just to help us appreciate the place of choice. In the sense that King Saul had an opportunity of having his progeny being the great royal family of the people of Israel. But the first thing that he did is that he did not please God. He walked in the ways of evil and perversion. And as such, the royalty was taken out of King Saul's family in the tribe of Benjamin, and it went to the tribe of Judah. We are able to see that choice 
places a very important role in our lives. God knows what is going to happen in the future, but does not control our choices. For instance, the Lord has prepared a place for his people to go to, but it is our choice on earth that will depend, that will make us realize that we will go to a place that he has prepared in heaven or will cause us to burn in hell. It is my desire that we exercise the free will given by God to choose to be in heaven. Lastly, all this story, why are we learning about Jacob? Why are we learning about Joseph? Why are we learning about the Israelite tribe? Why are we learning about Canaan? Here is the reason why. There is a promised land that has been prepared. There is a hope that is given to you and I. That once the cost of living has dealt with us, once we have all been dealt with by death, some may not die. Once diseases and affliction, betrayal, famine, calamities, name them, have assailed us, there is hope that there will be a promised there is a promised land where we all hope to abide and we all hope to dwell in. The conclusion of Genesis is full of three events of hope. First, there is hope that Israel will return to the promised land. Why? Because Joseph dies and says that when the Lord remembers you and takes you out of Egypt, do carry my bones with you. So this very promise that God gave to Jacob, that do not be afraid of going to Egypt, I will go with you and I will bring you back, shows that in the carrying of Joseph's bones back to Canaan in the Exodus, that was the concluding remark in the book of Genesis, that the promised land is assured they shall return there in spite of the many struggles that Egypt afforded, the promised land was an assured place to be in. Secondly, there is hope that God will turn evil into good. The very many years that the children of Israel experienced in the land of Egypt, some were beautiful, some were marked with slavery, but they came to an end. Similarly, in the life of Joseph, he had a whole time struggling with envy amongst his brothers struggling with an identity crisis in Egypt, imprisoned for no apparent reason, falsely accused, mistreated, but ultimately good triumphed. It might have taken long, but it finally triumphed. In our lifetime, the assurance from God is, though evil may appear to be winning, at long last, good will triumph. God himself brought the brothers of, Egypt, of Joseph to Egypt. The brothers lay prostrate before him. The brothers confessed what they had done. Even the human failures that we experience will ultimately come to an end because God's providence overrules. And thirdly, there is hope that God will save fallen mankind. The story of Joseph's death brings to us a huger, broader concept that God actually will save us, that the Lord will clothe us with immortality. It is not enough in our bodies, whether we are short, whether we are tall, whether we are light-skinned, whether we are dark, whether we have good hair or not. This body that we have is perishable. But God will clothe, will clothe us with immortality and give us a body that does not die. Then we will be forever with our Lord. So what is required of you and I? As we have looked into the last chapters of the book of Genesis, it is a stark reminder that our life is not just what we have here on earth. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Friend, after all this is passed away, the loved one we have lost, the good jobs that we have lost, the opportunities that have bypassed us, the dreams that we have not fulfilled, they will all pass away. But there is something. God is making all things new. We are going to a land that knows no pain, that knows no sorrow, that knows nothing that defiles. It will be a place where there will be no tears. Verse 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. You need a reason to save the person who has hurt you. Forgive them. You need a reason to be saved 
from the anger and guilt that has consumed you. Forgive and let go. In the new land that the Lord is prepared, there is no tears. There is nothing that causes pain. Everything has flown away. How I wish that you be part of that. Jacob left Canaan, went to Egypt, but he did not lose hope that the Lord would deliver them. Today, the Lord is telling you, regardless of your situation, he will make all things new. Do share with us your comments, your thoughts, your experience in the study of God's word. And I hope you'll make it a delight to join us as you continually study what God has in store for us. It's been a blessing sharing God's word with you. I invite you to share in a prayer. And as I pray, it's my desire that you will present that which is hurting you to the Lord. Your broken dreams, your shattered hopes, your wounded heart. The Lord is capable of making all things new. Let us pray. Everlasting God and Father in heaven, how excellent is your name. We thank you for the assurance that we have seen in your word. That you made all things new for Joseph. You are able to make all things new for us. You saved Joseph's brothers from the guilt that had been weighing them down for years. May you also save us from this guilt of sin that is weighing us down. You gave Jacob an opportunity to see his long lost son. May you unite parents with their children, dear Heavenly Father. Broken families, may they see eye to eye one more time. Not because of anything they have done, but because you are the Lord. I pray that you may place hope in the hearts of children in whatever households you have placed them in. Hope that would keep them struggling, fighting day by day to have things right and make things right with you. I pray that you may each give each one of us an experience of studying your word, listening from you and learning of your patient ways because you are a faithful and a good father. As you have studied the book of Genesis, May we be ushered, dear Lord, to constantly remember that when all things is said and done, all heaven, all earth will pass away, for you will make everything new, including giving us a new name, giving us a new body, giving us a new experience, and thus we shall forever be with our Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayer, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You can subscribe for more of this lesson as we study together. You can like and share with your friends. It's a blessing to experience God's word. Till next time, be blessed.